Hi, I'm Dr. Jim Wheelis. I'm a pediatric neurologist and epileptologist at LeBonner Children's Hospital, Tuber Sclerosis Center of Excellence in Memphis, Tennessee. Today, we're gonna to talk about the treatment of seizures in people with Tuber Sclerosis Complex, or TSC. When we discuss treatments for tuber sclerosis complex, there are four big categories we think of uh, for our patients. So uh, there are patients that we use uh, medications only. That's the only category they get to. There are patients for which we use device therapy. There are some patients that are epilepsy surgery candidates, and then there are patients we treat with dietary means. And then there are some that have a combination of those. So they may be on medicines and device or medicine and diet. The mainstay though, if you look, is clearly medical uh, therapy and then select groups of some of our patients with tuber sclerosis complex, we may use one of the other therapies in addition. Those all have to be tailored to the individual patient with tuber sclerosis complex, uh, but they're all on the table depending on how that patient's epilepsy is doing and which one we need to utilize to help get that patient's seizures under the best control. We know that if you have tuber sclerosis as the cause of your seizures, that you or your child is likely need to be on medical therapy for many years. So to make this work for the child and for the family, there are some general uh, kind of principles that we like to live by. So one is to use medicines, if at all possible, that are either an extended release formulation or have what we call a long half-life, which means the medicine stays in the person's system hopefully all day long or longer so they can only dose the medicine once or twice a day and we can avoid middle of day dosing which may be during school or work or other times. Uh, this also gives us what we call end of dose uh, kind of forgiveness which means that if we're due to take our medicine at bedtime and we're up later that night uh, it stays in our system so we have a lot of flexibility on when exactly we need to take that dose. So if during school days, we take a morning dose at 6 a.m. and an evening dose at 8 or 9 a.m. On the weekends, if the morning dose is at 9 a.m. and the evening dose is at 10 or 11, we'll still be fine. We don't have to be exactly 12 hours apart and exactly the same time every day. And the short answer is no. Uh, we know that younger children can have different seizure types uh, than older children, adolescents, or adults. So we're really tailoring the medication to what the child uh, needs. Having said that, there are some seizure types that we just know are more dangerous for the child and that we really have to get well controlled. So patients that are having convulsive seizures or what used to be called grand mal seizures, we have to vigorously treat those. Uh, we know that if children are still having those, and especially if they're having them in their sleep, that they're at risk of what we call SUDEP. It's S-U-D-E-P, or Sudden Unexplained Death in Epilepsy. So uh, those are the most worrisome seizures and the ones that we really kind of have to target and control the best we can, uh, even if the child's still having other more minor seizures during the day, but that are not convulsive. Another seizure type we really target and want to get rid of is, if at all possible, are seizures that we call drop attacks. Uh, where the child is standing and they may have a seizure where they just fall immediately without warning, just because we know those can lead to injuries from the fall itself. Uh, so there are a lot of different seizure types we can see, but there are some that we say, gosh, we've really got to do as much as we can to get all these controlled because they're much more dangerous uh, to the person we're caring for that has tuber sclerosis complex. And there are some that we tend to avoid. There are a few we avoid because of the drug-drug interactions with our mTOR inhibitors. So these are our medicines, sirolimus or avirolimus, that many of our patients take to help with either their kidney disease or lung disease. And we know they're critical for that, so we don't want our seizure medicines to be interfering with that function. So medicines that could interfere with the function of how well uh, those other medicines would work are phenobarbital, uh, dilantin or phenytoin, atregretol or carbamazepine. So in general, we would avoid using those 
and someone that had tuberous sclerosis complex because we're concerned if they end up then having uh, irvirolemus or serolemus added to their medicines that they wouldn't work as well. Uh, the couple other ones that we tend to avoid in general, but it's not an absolute, are topiramate or zonisamide because rarely in children, and it's pretty uncommon, it may be one in 200 children, they have renal stones related to those. And we know that folks with tuberous sclerosis complex can are already at risk for kidney problems, and we don't want to do anything that would kind of add to that. So unless we have to, we tend to avoid those medications uh, as well in our patients with tuberous sclerosis uh, and epilepsy. We have a lot of different medications that are available to treat uh, epilepsy in our patients with tuberous sclerosis, but we have some new treatments that are just on the scene. And probably the one that we are asked the most about is the prescription formulation of cannabidiol or epidiolex. Uh, this compound has been evaluated in our patients with seizures and tuberous sclerosis complex. Those studies have just been finished and that data is at the uh, Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. Uh, we anticipate that approval will come uh, this year and then it'll be widely available for prescription for our patients with tuberous sclerosis complex. Uh, when that occurs, a couple things to keep in mind is that medicine can elevate our blood levels of Afinitor. Uh, so we have to be careful we add that in. Many of our patients are also on Afinitor. We're gonna to have to look at blood levels of their Affinitor, along with blood levels of the cannabidiol oil or Epidiolex, and then maybe make uh, changes appropriately. Uh, it's not a problem adding it, we just need to be aware of that interaction and make appropriate adjustments to our blood levels. For many of our patients, the Epidiolex has been quite beneficial in improving their seizure control. The other thing we have to think about for our patients with seizures is for some of our patients, they may have their intermittent regular seizures, uh, not very frequent, but then once in a while and often unexpectedly, they may either have a cluster or a grouping of their seizures close together or a longer, uh, worse event that's worrisome to the family at home. In the past, the only real option was either to ride it out or go to the emergency room. Uh, in, after that, we then had development of a product that could be given rectally. It was called Diastap, but it was a diazepam rectal gel that was given rectally. That was very helpful for many of our young patients, but for our older patients, it just was socially not often acceptable, and especially if they were out in public. Uh, now we have two real uh, huge additions that can be used as rescue therapy. They're what we call intranasal administration. So they're in a canister like this. You just hold it up to the nose and push there's a little button on the bottom, you just push in, it delivers the dose. Uh, the patient can be in the middle of a seizure, they don't have to be awake and cooperative, they don't have to breathe in. Uh, those are sold under the names of Nasolam, which is, which is an intranasal midazolam preparation, and Valtoco, which is an intranasal diazepam. Both of them work within minutes to stop the seizures, and for many patients, then they can control those kind of rare worsening events at home without having to go to the emergency room. It's also very convenient to have on hand if you're traveling or away from a hospital where you just couldn't go even if you needed to. So one of the things we try and make sure for our patients that have tuberous sclerosis and epilepsy uh, that we reviewed with the families is a couple plans. So one is what to do if you're late with your medicine, because as we know, these children and young adults, the adults, you're gonna take this medicine for many years. So if you sleep in, if you accidentally forget a dose, depending on the medicines, with some medicines we may say you can make that up, it's safe. With others we may say no, just wait till the next dose and kind of get back on track as quick as you can so we don't have a seizure in there. Uh, but we tailor that to the medicines you're on. So uh, for every patient we should have a plan of what to do uh, for your specific medicine. In young children we often have a plan for what to do if they just happen to get a stomach bug and they throw up their medicine, uh, if they throw it up when do you kind of redose it to get it in their system? And if you can't get it in, kind of what are backup options? So we have 
kind of cover that in advance before it occurs too. Uh, and then the other one we like to have documented is a rescue plan for what if your seizures get worse at home, what can you safely do? And then we should be reviewing that to say, if you did it, did it actually work? And if not, we should be adjusting that going forward. So those are typical plans we should kind of be reviewing at every visit to make sure we've got uh, in the chart just on top of just seeing how you're doing with your uh, treatment of your seizures.